issue. So we'll yeah, we try can answer request the that. participants to kindly answer in the question and answer box that will appear in your video so that it will make it yeah. more attractive. So this is a question for you. And uh, once you talk to the parent, the next uh, situation he tells you is that, um, let me see. Yeah, uh, somebody has written answer. something. Clean the bite, uh, bite clean site, site, site immediately and uh, visit the hospital immediately. Yes, excellent. So uh, you wash the site and you immediately visit a hospital. Even if you are if you are not available, you tell the person to go to a nearby hospital or a nearby center to take some kind of treatment after wound washing. You should, usually he should not be asked to wait for a day or two. Okay, okay, you come tomorrow or you come to a day after tomorrow. And uh, I'm getting a lot of answers. Both ARV and uh, wound washing should be done. Yes, okay, my slides are moving before I'm able to. I just let me, let me see. Ah, so both ARV and wound washing, excellent. For question first, wash with soap and water and reach immediately. Yes, excellent. So the message is that uh, decision to treat is that you have to treat the patient uh, whenever he comes to you. You should not delay treatment to a patient who has received a dog bite. Now, this part two of the question is that the child has been bitten by a pet dog. So the neighbor, the, the patient tells you that it is my pet dog. So how do you decide treatment? This is part two of the question. So start writing in the chat box. Uh, okay, clean and categorize and decide. Great. Category three, both rabies, vaccine, immunoglobulin, or molecular antibody. Excellent. So no, uh, so no difference in stray versus pet dog. So the attendant says, Ki, Dr. Sab, then why do I immunize my dog? I have given my dog a vaccine uh, by the veterinarian. And uh, then what is the sense of giving the vaccine to the dog if uh, I have to take a complete vaccine and immunoglobulin? So anybody can answer that. Uh, okay. So no difference in stray versus pet. I agree with that. So even if the pet is, uh, even if it is a pet or it is a stray, it does not make a difference. Definitely yes. And even if the pet is immunized or unimmunized, your treatment protocol remains the same. So now how do you answer uh, the query that then why do I get my dog vaccinated? Is there any sense of getting my dog vaccinated? Let me see. Vaccination is not 100% protective. Perfect. So uh, one of the academic pearls which we used to publish, I, publ I put in a paper in that, which showed us that only 50% of uh, dog vaccines are, uh, well, uh, dogs are protective post-vaccination. That simply implies that if you, are, uh, if you have a pet dog and you've given him a vaccine, there is a 50% chance that he'll be having protective titer at six months of, uh, post six months of vaccination and by one year, this falls even further. Having said that, it does not mean that you do not get your dog vaccinated. You should get your dog vaccinated. Even if he gets 40%, 50% protection, that is also a good number. And maybe after subsequent doses, that level may increase. So this study was conducted somewhere in Bangalore. It was initially done on stray dogs. So the thought was that because stray dogs are malnourished, they have lots of parasites and are ill and don't get good diet, they are not developing adequate protection. So the next study was conducted in dogs, which were pets. And there also the figure was coming around to be the same. So maybe the, so maybe it is the problem with the quality of vaccine which we have in India, the animal vaccine which we have in India, because it is not giving more than 50 to 60% protection. So um, let me see. Both the RS and the wound, okay, clean the bite side. This we have all got. Uh, so uh, I think we have got the answer uh, that even if the dog is vaccinated, you have to uh, still follow the categorization, wash the wound, give immunoglobulin and the vaccine as needed. So now uh, coming back to the slide. So this disease is as old as our civil civilization. So paintings like Oriental physicians as far back as 3000 BC have shown dogs biting humans. So this phenomena is there and this disease is very old. And uh, now the countries where this disease is not uh, found. So this was an, again a question, but the answer is visible on these slides. Uh, rabies is not there in Australia, New Zealand, I think Greenland or the top port, I think that is Norway, Finland or those countries. So the question will be why? 
the simple answer is that uh, countries like greenland are so cold that dogs usually don't survive that much and uh, in con- uh, countries like australia uh, these are these were basically huge islands australia new zealand the animals with uh, rabies the only way of rabies reaching these islands was through transport by a ship and it would take more than 10 to 12 days for the ship to reach these islands so by that time the animal which had rabies would die on the way and would be thrown into the sea so the rabies could not reach islands like australia and new zealand so similar story in india also we do not have rabies in lakshadweep or uh, andamans uh, same story because it takes 10 to 12 days to reach there by sea it used to take 10 to 12 days to reach by sea from the mainland so rabies uh, virus infected animals would not survive they would die on the way so these islands do have rabies and uh, nowadays goa is also claiming to be rabies free over last 2 3 years and this is because of uh, good animal vaccination program abc program animal birth uh, control and animal vaccination program so they have done it on large scale in goa and they and after you have achieved 70% uh, uh, vaccination coverage in dogs uh, then the transmission of rabies gets stopped and uh, thus goa has been able to control it they are claiming to have achieved the target of zero rabies let us see how far they sustain it and this is again being tried in other states also so presently lakshadweep and andaman yes and goa maybe <laughs> so this is the slide showing you that lakshadweep and andaman does not have rabies other than that the whole country is endemic to rabies so now why rabies uh, why are we discussing rabies it's a lethal disease and untreatable disease so once you had it you have had it simply means that there are hardly any survivors and those patients who have survived have had severe neurological sequelae and uh, there are around 15 to 20 case reports of patients surviving from uh, uh, rabies as such and most of these patients were those who were afflict- afflicted by bad rabies the dog rabies virus somehow is uh, more uh, dangerous and uh, hardly any patient has survived after being bitten from uh, dogs getting rabies from dogs it is the bad rabies patient which have shown some survival and a few patient one or two patients had prior immunization so they did develop rabies but uh, they survived but again they were with severe neurological sequelae these are just case reports so you can understand that very very uncommon so now and there is an organization by the name of dndi which is working on neglected tropical diseases they have come up with a protocol and an antibody monoclonal antibody which they are wanting to try on rabies patients to see survival animal models have shown some success to the tune of 60 to 70% if picked up very early that is rabies picked up very early and around 30% if picked up uh, with uh, with symptoms like uh, hydrophobia aerophobia so when they have picked up uh, rabies in later stages so they want to try it in humans let us see how it pans out but presently it's uh, 100% fatal and nearly 100% preventable so worldwide around 61 to 65000 deaths per year with india showing around 20000 deaths so 20000 deaths is a data which is um, 19 years old 2004 data and uh, we are still waiting for fresh data icmr is conducting a, a surveillance across the country across all 30 32 states and hopefully by the uh, next year or 25 we will have some data on the number of rabies deaths in the country uh, delhi reported 50 deaths last year uh, of course all 50 were not from delhi around 8 to 10 were from delhi and the remaining were from the neighboring states like up rajasthan and haryana and uh, there was a global burden of disease study which estimated around 5000 5000 rabies deaths in the country and the bad part is that these are all people who were healthy and active who did not suffer from any ailments and were on the road bitten and they developed rabies so of course equivalent to two deaths every hour in india highest in the world so we are highest for everything in the world and 40% of victims are children yes 40 to 50% are children because of their inquisitive nature small size they want to play with the dog they pull the tail of the dog they a dog feels that this child is small so it can easily attack the child and overpower him so that is the reason and of course because of their smaller height the dog is able to attack their face and uh, the highly innervated area especially the face and neck region 
So uh, 40 to 50 percent victims are uh, children, and uh, rabies also 40 to 50 percent is in children. So now the question comes that which animal bites do not transmit rabies? So these are the ones which which transmit rabies. The ones which do not transmit rabies, you can put in the answer in the chat box if you have any doubts. Uh, somebody has said with air transport, you can think of transmission of rabies. Yes, but the ones who dogs which go via air are usually immunized and pets. So it's a very little chance that they will carry rabies to the island. Uh, but yes, that is a possibility. There is no doubt. But till date, there is no rabies found that dead uh, animals have been analyzed for rabies virus. They have all been found to be negative. That is the way surveillance is done. So now what animals do not transmit rabies? Any answers? Uh, let me see. Cows, goats, rabbits. So cows and goats can theoretically transmit rabies. Very uncommon. Rabbits do not transmit rabies, right? And other than rabbits, the mouse found in our households do not transmit rabies. And other than that, squirrels were thought not to transmit rabies, but around 15 samples of dead squirrels tested in uh, uh, Sri Lanka found that they contained rabies virus. So there is a doubt with squirrels. And because squirrels are usually very, uh, they run away from humans. So if a squirrel particularly comes and attacks you, if it's an unprovoked bite, it's better to take uh, complete post-exposure prophylaxis. And uh, in case of doubt, you take complete post-exposure prophylaxis. But yes, uh, mice, that is uh, rats, uh, which are found in households, do not transmit rabies. And rabbits do not, uh, around a week ago, I got a call from a practitioner key. The person, uh, the child was bitten by a turtle. So reptiles do not transmit rabies, turtles, birds. So why birds do not transmit rabies? Because uh, of the variation in body temperature. They have a higher body temperature. So virus does not, does not survive there. So birds do not transmit and uh, turtles or other reptiles like snakes and alligators and all these do not transmit rabies. Other than that, all mammals transmit rabies. In India, bats have not been found to carry rabies virus. There was a report of uh, two or three bats uh, having rabies virus, but they have not been found to transmit it to humans till date. So bats we are still taking as negative. Um, Indian continent bats do not, domestic rats, yes. So bandicoots, bandicoots uh, are what? Some bigger mouse, I think, are bandicoots. Yes, they can. So whenever you are in doubt, somebody comes that it was a, a mammal which was such huge in size, much larger than a mouse, we call it goose in Delhi, or uh, then we uh, give and post rabies, uh, we give complete prophylaxis. So now, uh, next slide. Yeah, wow. My slide is stuck. Yeah. So now modes of transmission. So it's very interesting. Number one is animal bites. We all know that. Licks on abraded skin and mucosa, yes. Scratches, yes. So there was a huge discussion in the community medicine group that why should scratches transmit rabies? I said, okay, if you bathe the dog well with soap and water and don't let him lick his paw, then the scratch won't transmit. Otherwise, the scratch will transmit because dogs keep drooling and licking their paws and all that. So that is the reason we say scratches transmit rabies. And there are uncommon modes, aerosol, respiratory transmission. So uh, I remember I got a call from one of the practitioners, a child had come with the mother, very anxious that a stray dog had sneezed on the child and the child had inhaled the uh, whatever sneezing material, you can call it, the aerosol from the uh, patient, the child, and from the animal, the child had inhaled what to do. Uh, another situation is organ transplantation. Uh, so there is a study wherein, in fact, there was a report wherein a patient died and the organs were transplanted to three, four people and all of them have developed rabies. So organ transplantation will transmit rabies. Ingestion, the standard story is that uh, I remember sitting in OPDs and uh, suddenly 15, 20 villagers will come that uh, Doxa, my cow has died and all these people drank the milk of the cow. And what to do. So that was a scary situation with 15, 20 people standing outside and uh, with sticks, of course. So you have to decide your safety first. If they want a vaccine, give it to them. But WHO says that any kind of milk, raw or boiled, boiled milk, the virus is killed. So if you heat the milk over 50 degrees, the virus is killed. 
but raw milk also does not contain rabies virus it has been proven very clearly that rabid animals animal milk does not contain rabies virus this has been mentioned clearly in the who document the revision through the 2018 so animal milk does not transmit but of course you have to look at the practical aspect when you are dealing with uh, this kind of a situation another story with aerosol transmission now i remember is uh, the resident intubated a patient uh patient died and later on there was a history of dog bite now what to do and again the residents were ready to go on strike they wanted immunoglobulin and vaccines and all that so it was a very scary situation and the head of community medicine called me up to doctor i have to answer this question a committee is sitting and the residents want to go on strike they want vaccine and immunoglobulin what to do so till date there is no case reported wherein there is human transmission that is uh no human to human transmission so no case has been reported till date um but of course in a scary situation like this when everybody is so anxious it is always safer to give a you know, uh, vaccine and if they want you can give them you know global and also but till date no case has been reported the so last one is sexual transmission so a lady died because of rabies and uh, the husband said that okay i have had sexual relations with her and 3 days later two more men came they said they also had relations with her what to do uh, it can be the other way around the man dies of rabies and uh, one or two ladies come that they have had sexual relations with the man here in also there is no evidence as such that semen contains the virus and uh, but uh, so giving benefit of doubt the only way out is you give immunoglobulin and vaccine to the people who have been exposed and the only way you can give immunoglobulin is through iim route right so these are the four situations Uh, which are uncommon, but which which do come up often. Or yes, I got a call again a few days ago that a child had drank the water from a bowl from which the dog used to drink water. Dogs have what to do? So uh, again, the virus dies on uh, drying. The virus dies over fifty degrees centigrade. The virus can survive a few hours in room temperature. Now it becomes a very tricky situation wherein the dog has lapped up water from a bowl and a child of say six uh, one year or something goes crawling and starts drinking from the bowl what bowl bowl what to do so uh, difficult to answer scenario and uh, i you know i was a bit uh, skeptical thinking ki can the virus survive in uh, the bowl yes if the dog has just lapped up the water 15 20 minutes ago you should give immunoglobulin and vaccine but if the dog drank it from the bowl around 3 4 hours ago maybe you, there is no need to do anything so uh, avoiding all these situations the best way is you give pre exposure prophylaxis to all families who have pets in their household so it is usually this usually happens when you have a pet in the household so give pre exposure prophylaxis whenever you bring a pet so these situations do not occur at all so now another question uh, what is the incubation period of rabies a lot of times we get calls ki doc sahab uh, we get a story ki kutte ne to usko uh, okay i'll come in english because it is tamil nadu uh, the dog had bitten 5 years ago and now he has developed rabies or the dog bit 20 years ago now the person has developed rabies so is it possible to have uh, rabies after 20 years of a dog bite um is it possible so somebody answered 9 days to 9 months yes 9 days if the bite is directly on a nerve ending on the face 9 10 days you can develop rabies uh to 9 months okay not a bad answer any other guesses let me see um is there yes 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 i don't know we asked for what i forgot what i had asked for uh so uh so incubation period is highly variable it ranges between 6 days to 6 years and averages 30 to 90 days more than 6 months it is seen in less than 1% so it is very uncommon to have rabies after 6 months less than 1% not unknown you may have but uh what we say is that there are a lot of unrecognized bites which happen especially in children the child is playing with a dog and dog simply has slightly nibbles or scratches the child child does not come does when he comes home does not disclose the bite to the family and uh, as far as the family is concerned he has never been bitten by a dog i remember a 
when the family came to me with a 6 year old child or 7 year old child and on asking him he had did not give a history of dog bite but was having hydrophobia and aerophobia where did he get the virus from it must have been from some kind of a animal exposure and he was vehement that no a dog has not bitten him the parents were very sure the dog has not bitten him so these are unrecognized bites uh, when kids play with uh, dogs and don't report to the parents in fear of getting bitten up and then they forget so um matlab anybody who comes to you so i got a call around uh, there was a huge discussion in another community medicine group um around 15 days ago and i got this question personally ki doctor what needs to be the answer a person comes to you after one year saying that he was bitten by a dog and uh, because he saw he heard somewhere that vaccine in immunoglobulin has to be given what to do and this question is very difficult to answer that what is the upper limit of giving rabies immunoglobulin because uh, if you look at the data you can have rabies after 6 uh, months also yes but uh, is the virus still lying in the wound after 6 months or 9 months or one year at the local site so do you need to infiltrate so uh, there are no guidelines as such nobody can create such kind of upper limits of guidelines this is just practical uh, uh, or the practical experience or maybe um logic which you can use that okay maybe after a few months there is no sense in instilling immunoglobulin because after that if the virus is was there it would have bound to nerve ending and started ascending to the brain so once the virus is bound to the nerve ending no amount of immunoglobulin can help the patient so these questions are difficult to answer so now what are the current treatments we follow as uh, discussed in the first questions uh, the wound is washed the wound is disinfected and then we give vaccines so um this sometimes most of the times does not work why i'll give you a few few case reports uh, in fact uh, at the uh, looking at the data of uh, 50 patients which came to ncd uh, infectious disease hospital with rabies around 8 to 10 were the patients who had received vaccine but no immunoglobulin and then they developed rabies and one patient or one or two patients were those who had received immunoglobulin also along with vaccine and developed rabies and in fact the same story happened in kerala also wherein immunoglobulin and vaccine both were received by the patient and even then they developed rabies so we'll discuss that later on but uh, these are just two or three case reports uh, because now journals have stopped stopped publishing such case reports a well known fact that if you give only vaccine uh, to a patient of dog bite he will uh, he is not protected so a 55 year old female present to the hospital with fever and egg vomiting diagnosis of rabies was made and he was bitten on uh, on the bridge of the uh, on the nasal bridge three doses of vaccine was given developed rabies patient was not given rabies immunoglobulin another one from aurangabad again a 3 year old child received vaccine but no immunoglobulin developed rabies another one from bangalore a uh, 15 year old girl fever and egg vomiting uh there was a unprovoked cat scratch two months back back and cat was bitten by a rabbit dog immunized with a complete course of rabies vaccine rig was not given and patient developed uh, rabies and died so what is wrong do vaccines fail so what happens is that we all know that rabies vaccines produce antibodies uh, any vaccine will uh, start stimulate the production of antibodies after day 7 and which starts peaking by day 14 to 21 so uh if there is a situation wherein the virus can bind to the nerve ending before day 7 the patient will develop rabies in spite of getting the vaccine so if the incubation period is uh, shorter in case of harris bites as early as 5 days so you have a bite on highly innervated areas like face fingertips or the perineal scrotal area or the bite is so deep that the animal has bitten deep into the muscle and hit the nerve ending nerve itself so there in the virus will be directly inoculated onto the nerve so uh, these are the situations wherein uh, the vaccine will not be able to protect so we need some kind of ready made antibodies for immediate protection and what are these uh, special so these are the bites like face like multiple sites fingers genitalia so shorter incubation period are always high risk so these patients will require some kind of ready made antibodies which are immunoglobulins now coming to categories of uh, exposure as per who um 
so for us uh, the easiest way of remembering is that whenever there is even a drop of blood or serum oozing out from a site wherein the animal has bitten or scratched it is category 3 very simple even a drop of blood or serum oozing from the site where the animal has scratched or bitten it is category 3 now if you are not sure that uh, uh, somebody has raised his hand but i do not know how how i'll take the question so maybe we can take the questions in the end um so uh the so the problem is that uh, yeah so uh problem occurs sometimes when uh, you are not very sure if it is category or 2 or 3 you see a mark there and uh, there is just a scratch or abrasion kind of a thing there so take a spirit swab a simple swab containing spirit the one which we have in our clinics everywhere and rub it at the site wherein the patient says that he was probably bitten or scratched by the animal if there is burning at that site burning or tingling that simply means that the integrity of the skin is broken and it is category 3 so we call it the spirit test or the swab test whatever you want to call it an extremely simple take a spirit swab rub it at the site there is burning or tingling it is category 3 issue over uh, you the patient needs immunoglobulin <clears throat> okay yeah Ah, so uh, this is what uh, any wound where a drop of blood is seen, as I have, I have told you. Another thing is, uh, whatever patients report to you, they are usually category three. Hardly any patient will come to you with category two or category one indication. In fact, uh, there is a lot of discussion going on in our expert groups that should we remove category two because there should be no such thing as category two. Either the person is uh, uh, exposed to rabies or not exposed to rabies. so simple uh, simply saying that uh, it is a uh, simply it is causing confusion to practitioners and if you look at the registers in rabies clinic a lot of patients who are category 3 are labeled as category 2 too because there is a small wound and a drop of blood or serum oozed out so they made it category 2 so it is category 3 there is a talk of uh, starting out with another category that is category 4 wherein there is a bite wherein the uh it is a deep wound and the nerve endings are directly hit upon or highly innervated areas but um do not uh, go in for such categories for us life is simple a drop of blood or serum it is category 3 and he needs immunoglobulin issue over you are confused move a spirit swab over the side there is burning or tingling it is category very simple not to get confused so now uh treatment for us is immunoglobulin wound washing and vaccination so now coming to rabies immunoglobulin so rabies immunoglobulin are uh, derived from there are three major sources of rabies immunoglobulin one is animals and second is human so uh, equine uh, rabies immunoglobulin are derived from horses blood so i had been to a horse farm where this immunoglobulin is manufactured so there is a huge farm and lot of enclosures where horses are kept these are not basically those arabian horses the high high bred ones the tall horses used for races these are those cattoos uh, and khachars we call it the cross bred ones which are used mules in english you call them used to transport uh, goods and uh, those kind of animals and they are given vaccine every 10 days so they are uh, uh, made to develop antibodies so they are hyper immunized develop lots of antibodies then they are taken to a shed wherein they are held by ropes to a stand and a catheter is put into their neck that is their jugular vein interjugular vein and from there blood is drained and from the blood serum is separated rbcs are reinjected into the animal and from the serum the serum is again centrifuged purified then the fab portion is separated from the antibody and finally the ready uh, the pet the, 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 the Uh, antibodies are separated and packed into vials and of course after uh, testing their quality and the titers the antibodies are sent across the country to the various uh, rabies clinics so that is the way equine rabies immunoglobulin is manufactured hra uh, they are imported from china and uh, germany and uh, they are again i have not seen it being manufactured because it is not allowed in india so most probably they are injecting the humans with uh, ex, uh, extra vaccines and collecting blood from humans and secreting antibodies from there so these are the two sources 
and the third one I'll discuss as we go down the presentation. So human rabies immunoglobulin, the dose is 20 IU per kg and uh, there is no upper limit. So you simply multiply by 20. Earlier there was upper limit which was removed around in 2014 by WHO. Equine rabies immunoglobulin, the required, uh, required is 40 IU per kg body weight. So these are the, uh, this is the dose which you will administer, that is the maximum dose you will administer. So, a 100 kg person, you will uh, uh, give 40 into 100, that is 4000 IU of equine rabies immunoglobulin. That is the maximum dose you will administer to that patient. Again, why I am saying maximum is, I will come on to the next slide and tell you what has to be done actually. So, EREG, WHO says that sensitivity testing is not required to give equine rabies immunoglobulin. Uh, the reason is the mechanism by which the sensitivity test comes positive and the mechanism by which the reaction occurs after giving the immunoglobulin is different. So, uh, if you have a sensitivity test negative, does not mean that you will not have a reaction. Having said that, again, I personally have used more than uh, 1.5 lakh vials of rabies immunoglobulin, equine ones, and I have never needed to admit a patient for reaction because of equine rabies immunoglobulin. I mean, they are that safe. They are very much purified nowadays and the reactogenic portion is removed by the manufacturers and the product is very safe. We are uh, The earlier products which was available 15-20 years did give a lot of reactions but now the uh, technology has changed and the uh, product has become very safe. If you want to do sensitivity test because the problem is that the manufacturer PI, product insert, says that sensitivity has to be done because again, these PIs were made 15-20 years ago and to update the PI, they have to do a bridging study or some kind of a trial which the manufacturer does not want to invest money in. So, this uh, around two months ago, we had our expert group meeting in uh, National Center for Disease Control wherein we have decided to send a letter to all the manufacturers that if needed, they can do their uh, small trial and remove the word, uh, remove the line that sensitivity testing is needed in equine rabies immunoglobulin because uh, unnecessarily it causes a lot of confusion and the reactogenicity is very low. And again, as I said, the mechanisms of reaction are different. So if you still want to do the sensitivity testing, you take 0.1 ml of 1 is to 10 dilution of uh, uh, serum. That is, you take 0.1 ml of uh, serum uh, in an uh, insulin syringe, make it 1 ml. 0.1 ml, you make it 1 ml. So, that will be 1 is to 10 dilution. And you give it on the intradermal aspect of, uh, you give it intradermally over flexor aspect of forearm. And on the other arm, you will give normal saline. And dilution of this is, should be done by a normal saline. So, why I am saying normal saline is very important. I put it in red. Um, just around, this happened again, in fact, uh, second time, around six months ago, I went to the rabies clinic and sister said, sir, there is reaction. So, there is a lot of reaction to immunoglobulin, the manufacturer, the batch is bad, I think. I said, okay, what are you diluting it with? She said, oh, uh, whatever we are getting in the supply. I said, what are you getting in the supply? She said, sterile water because NS is not available. And so, you dilute it with NSL and uh, with sterile water. And you'll have lots of positive reactions. So, do not dilute in sterile water. Dilute it in normal saline whenever you do sensitivity testing. <clears throat> so now, um, after you have uh, after you've categorized the wound to category three and wound washing is done, we need to infiltrate the wound. Uh, so infiltrate as much as possible into and around the wound. And remaining, if any, should not be given intramuscularly. This has, this is, this has to be understood. This is a recent modification which we are trying to push in across the country, and this will save a lot of cost to the patient as well as to the taxpayer. That is the government where free immunoglobulin is being administered. So, uh, why we are saying this? Because uh, there is no viremia number one. So, when a dog bites you and the dog saliva has the virus, it is deposited at the local site. And from there, it binds to the nerve ending. So there is no viremia, no virus goes to the blood. So if you give it IM, the immunoglobulin will circulate into the blood and a small amount will come to the site where there was a bite. Now, second point. So the protective titer needed for protection is 0.5 IU. 
and this tight 0.5 IU per ml and this titer is not achieved after giving the immunoglobulin IM. Number three uh, problem is that when you give the immunoglobulin IM, it suppresses the vaccine more than when you give it ID. Fourth problem is when you have the option of giving IM, most of our nursing staff will want to give maximum dose IM and will do very little infiltration. A common practical problem in all the government hospitals, you call up, send one of your relative goes for after dog bite and you ask him, Ki, Kya hua? what happened? He will say, oh, sister didn't give anything in the wound or just a small drop in the wound. Remaining, she gave IM because the whole dose was covered. So uh, we have to remove the IM uh, giving of immunoglobulin, give immunoglobulin only into the wound. I hope you have understood the logic behind this. And the fifth and uh, the most important is it is cost effective. Why I'm saying this? Because a uh, lot of studies have been done wherein we have calculated the average requirement of immunoglobulin per patient. And it is coming to around 0.5 to 1 ml per patient. So if you say that uh, if you take a thousand patients, you estimate the amount of immunoglobulin required for wound infiltration in each of these patients, these patients, and then you average out some will require two ml, some will require half ml, some will require even 0.3 ml. So when you average out, it comes to around 0.5 to 1 ml. And if you go by the weight formula, it comes to around 4 or 5 ml. So basically, you are saving around uh, four to five times the cost to the exchequer or to the taxpayer or to the government or to the patient, whatever system you are in. So um, there is no sense in giving IM, immunoglobulin I'm talking about, give it only into the wound. Our next point is inject RIGs into all the wounds. This is again important. So if you have a bite at five places, you have to inject all five sites. You leave one site, if the virus is present in the saliva, it will bind at that side and you'll have rabies even after you have given immunoglobulin. So that is one of the reasons wherein we think that a patient who developed rabies after immunoglobulin developed it because maybe one or two uh, bite sites were not covered by the immunoglobulin. And third situation is that if the immunoglobulin is uh, the dose calculated of the immunoglobulin after you multiply by 40. So I got a call from... Uh, some a place near Chandigarh, a child had been mauled by stray dogs and uh, had been bitten all over the body and the child was weighing hardly 10 kgs. And if you go by the formula of 40 IU per kg, 14 to 10 is 400 IU, 1 ml has 3, 300 IU. So it came to around 1.4 ml or 1.3 ml total volume of immunoglobulin, which could had to be infiltrated. But the if you look looked at the child, he had been bitten at 10 places and the uh, bites were pretty long, um, but a big, a good size. So he required much more than that. So you can dilute that uh, dose calculated by the formula 40 into the body weight. That is equine I'm talking about. Then you dilute it with normal saline. You can dilute it even 15 to 20 times with normal saline if needed so that all the wounds are covered. Ideally, you should not exceed the dose of... Uh, Baby's immunoglobulin because otherwise you will suppress the vaccine. So that is the way dose finding studies are done. So maximum dose which does not suppress the vaccine and neutralizes the virus. So one part is neutralizing the virus in vitro in animal models and second part is in humans wherein the vaccine is not suppressed will give you the uh, dose of that immunoglobulin per kg body weight. So that is the way dose finding studies are done. We do not want to exceed it. Yes, in some situations we do, but uh, practically speaking, please don't exceed. And of course, the presently available preparations are extremely safe. So this is the uh, diagram I was talking about. Uh, multiplication locally in the muscle fiber. So when you have a bite, the virus is deposited in the wound. It multiplies in the at the local site and the virus, and then it enters the peripheral nerve ending, then ascends upwards to the brain. And so there is no viremia. So whatever treatment we need is here. That is local treatment, wound washing, and rabies immunoglobulin at the local site itself. So now the question arose that how much immunoglobulin is required in the local site? Uh, is there some estimate? Because what I have told you till now is the maximum dose required. That is, if you use equine, 40 into body weight. If you use human, 20 into body weight. And we will come to monoclonals and all that. They also have that uh, as per the brand. 
their uh, calculation of those. Uh, but if you the wound size varies from a puncture wound to huge wound. So how much volume is required to be infiltrated per centimeter of the wound? That is what we wanted to calculate because there was no standardization as such. The WHO document simply said that infiltrate as much as possible. Now, how much is as much? Do you have some kind of estimate? So we said, okay, let us do a study and try and find out what is the amount of immunoglobulin going into the wound using the uh, wound size based approach. So we did it in children because we are pediatricians using wound size based approach. Uh, so this is what we got. So what we got was, uh, So if the wound, there can be two types of wounds. In fact, three types, third by type we cannot cover. So one is linear wound, uh, which we get. Second is a wound which has a length and a breadth. And third is a deeper wound. Deeper wound is difficult to create some kind of a data bank for because uh, in periphery, uh, how will you measure the depth of the wound? Uh, in our situation, maybe we can use some surgical technique to measure, but in periphery, that will not be possible. So uh, you go for the first two varieties, that is the ones wherein you have a linear wound and in that what you can infiltrate is around 0.75 ml per centimeter of the wound. So you have a wound which is 2 centimeters long, you will require approximately 1.5 ml of immunoglobulin. Okay, so this is the volume in ml. Now if the wound has length and breadth therein you calculate the total area. So length is one centimeter, breadth is two centimeters. So two into one, that is two centimeters square. So in that, you will be able to infiltrate 3.18 ml per centimeter squared. So herein you will require around six ml of immunoglobulin to infiltrate the wound, right? So uh, I hope you have understood it. Length and breadth, you multiply length with the breadth and the requirement is 3.18 ml. So around three ml per centimeter squared and you have a linear wound and that is just a length of the wound, then the formula is 0.75 ml per centimeter. So we calculated regression equations and uh, we got some formulas also, but a uh, simple way to remember is 0.75 ml per centimeter in linear wounds and 3 ml per centimeter squared in wounds which have length and breadth. If you have a lot of depth, then it is very difficult to calculate for us also. You will have to go by the uh, estimate that infiltrate as much as possible till the immunoglobulin oozes out of the wound, right? So these two things are important. Third thing question asked is that uh, what to do about suturing these wounds? So ideally suturing should be avoided. Just one or two stay sutures may be given if a flap of screen is raised or the wound is very in such a manner that uh, the wound is totally open and gaping and you need to approximate or oppose the wound edges, just give one or two or three or four stray sutures after wound washing and immunoglobulin infiltration. Please uh, do not do beautiful embroidery with 5-5-0 that you not have a scar, I guarantee you, because one of the corporate hospitals, uh, friends, uh, relative went after dog bite, they did beautiful embroidery, 5-0 stitches, we guarantee you that you not have a scar. Then when he said, what about immunoglobulin, the surgeon said, I don't know what is immunoglobulin, not my job go to a physician. My job was teaching. I have done that. So um, minimum pricks and minimum suturing is very important. And secondary suturing may be done after two to 10 days uh, of uh, wound infiltration. So this is a letter we sent to the Delhi government uh, director health services. And uh, we held our trainings around uh, six months ago, wherein we have sensitized our uh, medical officers of uh, Delhi government hospitals to give only wound infiltration of immunoglobulin and remove the IM component of immunoglobulin. So this is the video which you can see how infiltration is being done. See this. So you see the needle is moving, not from inside the wound, but from outside the wound. Look at this, he's moving from outside the wound, goes just below the wound, and then injects the immunoglobulin till it oozes out of the wound. And all the wounds have to be covered. You can use a 26 gauge needle 
you can use a 26 gauge needle for infiltration. Uh, here she is using 23 gauge, but 26 gauge can also be used. Uh, so look at the number of wounds here. One, two, three, four, five, six. All these wounds have to be covered. Move just below the wound from outside the wound. Do not enter into the wound. Right? And just below the wound, you go, inject the immunoglobulin, come out. And a practical tip is, please wear goggles or uh, the ones we got for COVID. Uh, these are very important because sometimes you have splashes of immunoglobulin or spurts of immunoglobulin coming from the syringe and will spill on your face and then you will have the anxiety of getting the virus uh, on your face or into your eyes and then you'll be running around for uh, trying to get it treated. So wear goggles so that there are no spurts coming onto your face. So see, all the wounds are being covered. Here also, this is wound is being covered. If you're not able to cover it from one end, you go from the other end. So she's even able to cover it from one end and infiltrating the immunoglobulin. It should ooze out of the wound. Everywhere, everywhere it has oozed down. Right? So, and this is the last wound which is being infiltrated. Very important. Just below the wound and inject and withdraw. There, you see a spurt. So this spurt can sometimes come on your face or in your on your eyes. So, you have to be careful. So my nursing staff doing infiltration, usually she does it better than me. She does 10 infiltrations daily. I do only for VIP patients. Uh, the ones who come with a lot of telephonic calls, poor fellows, because I infiltrate once in two months and she does 10 patients a day. Uh, so look at her doing it. She does it much better than me, frankly speaking. So uh, what are the problems with acquired rabies immunoglobulin? Availability is limited. Affordability, high cost, especially HRIC, human rabies immunoglobulin. Safety, yes, there is some amount of risk of potential risk of transmission of blood-borne pathogens. Then there are risk of allergy reactions, not very severe, but yes, especially the um, type 3 uh, serum sickness, which we used to read in pathology robins. So this is that serum which they used to talk about. Uh, that problem is there. And sensitivity, WHO does not say so, but yes, people are doing it. So some cases, some sensitivity may or may not be required as per the situation. So now um, there are two beautiful products available in the market. One is a, a monoclonal antibody uh, which contains cocktail of two monoclonals that is docaravimab and mevroma vimab that binds to site 2 and site 3 of G glycoprotein that is twinrab. So this is a cocktail of two antibodies. Uh, which has been marketed by Zytus, available for more than two years now. And the dose is 40 IU per kg of body weight. So the dose of Twinrab is same as equine rabies immunoglobulin. No skin sensitivity testing is required and is recommended for use by WHO. There is another one available. I'll talk about it. So uh, I'll just give you a brief history as we have time, although not much. Um, WHO in 2002 felt that uh, because of uh, the increasing number of animal bites and requirement of immunoglobulin, hardly one or two percent patients were getting the immunoglobulin as the supply was limited and the cost was very high. So they said that, okay, let us have something artificial, which is made in labs and you can have limitless supplies. And other than that, um, other than that, it should be in uh, a cocktail of two antibodies. Why two? Because suppose the virus mutates, the second uh, uh, antibody in the preparation will at least will still bind to the virus. So you uh, ideally both, both should bind. And if the virus mutates, at least the second uh, antibody in the cocktail will bind to the virus. So cocktail of two antibodies against highly preserved antigenic reasons or regions of the virus, which are protected. So it has to be uh, two antibodies against two different antigenic portions of the virus, which are highly preserved and which are protective and which can be produced in large scale, simple words. So that was the requirement. So WHO selected two antibodies from two labs. One was from CDC Atlanta, USA, another was from Ottawa, Canada. Uh, they used, chose two different countries so that the copyright issues would not arise and the uh, uh, in uh, the patent issue, uh, issues will not arise and then gave it to another manufacturer to develop it further to phase trials. And so these are the molecular and GMP features. I'll not talk about them. And then they were tested on 
all these strains, 25, 30 strains of viruses available across the world, right from uh, foxes to dogs to countries like Turkey, Ethiopia, India, India Mexico, Sarajevo. So wherever they had available virus cultures across all these strains, these antibodies were tested and uh, they were found to be 100% uh, effective against all the available strains of the virus. So this product which we now have is Twinrap, which is marketed uh, in India and is in two strengths, 600 IU per uh, ml and 1500 IU per 2.5 ml. And uh, as I said, the dose is 40 IU per kg body weight. So this is Twinrap, a cocktail of two antibodies and the source is Murine manufactured by Zytus. Another one which has been available with us for last uh, five years is uh, completely human IgG1 monoclonal antibodies that binds to ectodomain of G glycoprotein. So this was developed by Mass Biologics, University of Massachusetts Medical School of USA and is also available in our country by the name of Rabishield. Uh, again, no skin sensitivity testing is required and uh, similar story, but this is a single monoclonal antibody. The dose of RMAB is 3.33 IU per kg body weight and uh, one vial will contain 100 IU in 2.5 ml that is 40 IU per ml. So remember the dose here is 3.33 IU per kg body weight. Twinrab and equine was 40, human was 20. This is 3.33 IU per kg body weight and uh, this is a uh, again a monoclonal antibody which is human. Uh, I'll tell you if we have time, what is human, what is murine, what is chimeric, what is humanoid, humanized. So uh, advantages are uh, the volume will be uh, less for infiltration in patients, more convenient, saves time. So this is another product which is available. So I thought why not compare all the antibodies uh, available to us. And I made this chart uh, wherein we compare equine with HRIC with murine with fully human RMAC. So Twinrab is murine cocktail RMAB and fully human RMAB is uh, the rabi shield. So the difference is that uh, you have a multiple myeloma, which is an immortal cell line and in it the splenic liver cells of uh, mice are fused to have a hybridoma, which will have a, a site, uh, which will have a antigen uh, gene, gene sequence injected into it which will produce the, this antibody. So the basic one is when you have a hybridoma or multiple myeloma cells with uh, uh, murine splenic cells, uh, having the uh, gene sequence producing the antibody against the rabies virus. So that is the murine kind of, uh, uh, murine kind of antibodies they'll be producing. Then next is shimeric, wherein you start replacing the antibody in such a, uh, the antibody in such a way that it becomes partially human but majority is still murine. Next is humanoid where it is majorly human and partially murine. And then finally you have the uh, culture which is fully producing fully human rabies monoclonal, monoclonal antibody. So the advantage of fully monoclonal antibody is that the production of auto antibodies is very less. So when you use it, you will have uh, very little auto antibodies produced against the antibody you are giving because uh, what are antibodies? They are also proteins. So if you inject protein into somebody's body, that person will react against the antibody and produce antibody against those antibodies. So murine ones, because they are totally for foreign, they will stimulate production of auto antibodies in 70 to 80 percent. That implies that uh, you cannot repeat the murine uh, cocktail of RMAB in future, whenever a person is bitten second or third time. Whereas fully human RMAB, there is hardly any production of auto antibody because they are similar to human antibodies. Therefore, you can re-inject this product later on in life if required and reactions will be slightly lesser as compared to murine. So fully human RMAB, you will not have serum sickness, whereas in murine, you may have serum sickness. And of course, equine, you will have serum sickness. Actually, you will not have serum sickness because again, they are human products. So, um, year of development, 1960, 1985, 1986, 2008, years. Sources, horse serum, human serum, mouse antibody recombinant, human antibody recombinant. Those, as I said, 40. 
for ERIC, 20 for HRIC, 40 for murine cocktail and fully human 3.33 per kg body weight. Immunogenicity, uh, ERIC, you can't repeat because they produce anti-drug antibodies, that is auto-antibodies. HRIC, um, they do not produce anti-drug antibodies. Murine, they produce anti-drug antibodies. Fully human, they will not produce anti-drug antibodies. So serum sickness is seen in EREC, murine, not very common, HREC, no, and fully human, no. Uh -huh. Cost, uh, equine for a 30 kg patient, 35 kg patient, the cost is around 150 to 200 rupees. Uh, in government supply in the market, it is around 400 rupees. HREC will cost you for that same weight around 20,000 rupees. Murine will cost you around 2,500. And fully human will cost you around 2,000 rupees. So these are just approximate costs to you, uh, to the patient uh, in a person weighing around 35, 40 kg. So you can compare the costs. And uh, nowadays, private sector is using uh, uh, the both Zydus product and the Serum Institute product, that is RMAP uh, by the name of Rabi Shield or Twinrap across the country. Uh, massively because HREG is very costly and EREG everybody is afraid of the actions. That is the status at present. So can we make it so, a faster so we can take questions also? That's yeah, yeah. I, I'm just looking at the time. It is 20, yeah, 35. Yeah. I was also thinking of the same. I thought I have a lot of time, but I found that yeah, the yeah. time gets limited. So yeah, just a few more slides. Now coming to vaccines. Very simple. Whatever vaccines you have are all the same. They are interchangeable. Use them in any way you want. Uh, basically, uh, earlier there was the issue that should we change brands? Now, WHO clearly says you can change brand whatever you want to. There is no problem. Two varieties are available. Vero cell line and PCEC chick embryo. The HDCV is no more available. Duck is not available. Reasons I will not discuss again because we have shortage of time. Uh, so now roots, intramuscular and intradermal for the vaccine. Intramuscular, uh, what we are following at this point of time in India is five vials for and five visits. That is 0, 3, 7, 14, and 28. Day zero, you give immunoglobulin also. A um, lot of questions come to me that uh, sir, WHO says four doses. You are saying five doses. See, we are in India. In case of medical legal issues, you have to follow the Indian guidelines. And they are five doses. We had a huge fight this time also in the last meeting three months ago. I was requesting for four doses on lines with WHO, but the uh, officials from ministry did not agree. They said we need more data. I said we have data, but they were not very convinced with it. They said, no, no, we are going to five doses. It's your choice. So presently, we are still with five doses. And uh, for your medical legal purposes, especially in private sector, go with five doses. WHO has recommended four doses, but you go with five. So now previously immunized, uh, very important. So till three months, the patient is prepared. What does that mean? Till three months, he can have as many bites he wants. He will not require anything. No immunoglobulin, no vaccine. Simply just wash the wound and do some local antiseptic dressing. After uh, three months, that is after 90 days, um, he will have to take two doses of vaccine, day zero and day three, and there is no requirement of rabies immunoglobulin. Now, I have put in this line in case of very severe bites or chances of animal being rabid is high, doctor may administer RIG2 along with full PEP treatment. This is not in the guideline. So this is the category four I was talking about. Herein, you may give immunoglobulin. Again, this is not part of the guideline. A lot of people have taken the picture of this slide and quoted me in a lot of places and people have asked me why I'm saying this is guideline does not say it, but if you have a highly innervated area wherein the animal has deposited saliva with the virus and uh, we know that uh, the antibodies, even the memory cells take 12 to 24 hours to get stimulated after the vaccine. So you may give some passive protection for those in 12 to 24 hours. After that, the vaccine will take over through the memory cells. So that is the reason I put it. Otherwise, as per guidelines, immunoglobulin are not required. So now intradermal regime, this is being used across the country in government setups, will cost effective, a viable alternative brings down the cost by five times. So you are spending just 20% the amount of money and we in government setup are using this. I also conducted a study found to be 100% effective. Uh, the same vial can be used uh, for six hours. 
that is one vac complete vaccination setting. It can be stored in fridge at 228 degrees. So you can use it for 6 to 8 hours after dilution. And uh, you have to discard it after 6 to 8 hours. Dose is 2 site IM, 0.1 ml at uh, left shoulder, 0.1 ml at right shoulder. So 2 site, 0.1 ml each. And the visits are less in this, in our government schedule. That is 222037. Day 14, you are not giving it, and then day 28. So day 0, 2 side, day 3, 2 side, day 7, 2 side. Day 14, there is no dose needed, and day 28 again, 2 side. You can give it over the upper arm, over each deltoid, or anterior lateral aspect of thigh also you can give it. Uh, so this is the regime which we are following, approved by NCDC. There is another regime, IP, IPC, Institute Pasteur de Cambodge which has been recommended by WHO, we are not following it. It is just three visits, 037, not, it has, they have removed day 14 and day 28 also. Marshall Pradesh is following this. We are not following it. So you, uh, if you are doing intradermal, you can very well do it. And, uh, but you have to follow the uh, two-site regime that is 037 and day 28 in India, right? This is what we are doing in all our government setups. So a beautiful bleb has to be raised 3 to 4 mm in size. If this bleb is not raised, you can repeat it again. But this bleb has to be raised. Now coming to pre-exposure, just one slide. Presently, uh, we are uh, giving 0728. That is three dose series intramuscular. Or if you want to give intradermal, just 0.1 ml at one site. Very important, 0.1 ml at one site on day 0, day 7, day 28. So from one vial, practically 8 people, theoretically 10 people can be given the uh, vaccine. So day 0, day 7, day 28, 0.1 ml at one side, that is pre-exposure. And whenever you have a dog bite, you will not require anything, no rabies immunoglobulin and vaccine on day 0 and day 3. And of course, you are prepared for 90 days. So till 90 days, nothing is needed. After 90 days, day zero and day three vaccine is needed. Nothing else. So now this question of uh, observing animals. I get a lot of uh, queries, ki docs are about, uh, what to do with the fourth dose or the fifth dose. Should, uh, should we observe dogs, cats, cows, buffaloes, horses, whatever animal which has bitten. So uh, this is an interactive question, but uh, I'll go ahead. So observation is valid only for dogs and cats. And uh, you should start treatment. So you give 037. And if the animal is alive, you give the day 28 dose so that you convert the pre, uh, post exposure prophylaxis to pre exposure prophylaxis. Right? Do not stop treatment after day 7. So you give three doses 037. Dog is alive on day 10. You don't give day 14, directly give day 28. So you convert post exposure to pre exposure. Okay, I have not, not talked about 07 regime of uh, pre exposure because we don't have time. That is a study which I am doing. Hopefully, we'll have data in another three months. So, uh, to summarize, most cases reporting to our OPDs are category three. That is, any bite or scratch with break in skin integrity. If in doubt, rub with a spirit swab. If stinging sensation is there, it is category three. Very simple. Use any RIG, but use RIG, rabies immunoglobulin. Use any brand you want, human, equine, twin rab, rabies shield, whatever you want, but use some RIG. Monoclonals, twin rab, and rabies shield are the future, being cost effective, safe, and available in unlimited quantities because human is very costly and very limited in supply. We'll have to switch, shift to monoclonals. Another thing is there is no role of IM administration of rabies immunoglobulin. So don't use rabies immunoglobulin by IM rule. And of course, awareness is the key to prevention of rabies deaths. Uh, this is the WHO schedule which I have discussed on the way. Poster in Hindi which we made and displayed in our rabies clinics. This is emergency tray which we have there in the rabies clinic. This is the wound washing area. So you have patients with uh, bite wounds and you tell them, ja, dho kya, go and wash your wound. Where will you go to? In the bathroom, you cannot put your foot in the wash machine and wash. So here in, we have a simple toilet jet here, wherein a person can wash his leg. And in the wash machine, you can wash it bitten on the hand. So a man is wa washing his wound with this soap. A girl washing here using this toilet jet. These are practical live pictures. I just went to the rabies clinic one day, clicked 10-15 pictures and came there. Practical. 
then you can see the sister, same sister, infiltrating the uh, wound there on the leg. There she's infiltrating on the face. You can see the bangles here, same sister is there. And then she, same sister, see the bangles, raising a beautiful bleb on the child. This child is proudly displaying his bleb. And uh, let's end rabies together. Rabies 0 by 2030 is the target of the government. We have the NAPRE program, National Program for Rabies. I think elimination, it should be NAPRE or prevention, whatever. So we have that program and we are planning to get this GXP of prophylaxis introduced as a pilot in a few government states and see what happens. And a lot of uh, interesting things are happening. And for queries, presently I'm here or we have an, a, a small association of like-minded doctors, consortium mm -hmm. against rabies. You people can uh, log into the website, send us mails if you have queries, join the association also. And we are the ones who are actively working in this field. And I think with this, I will say thank you so much. Um, we can have the questions now. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. That was a very interesting as usual. Uh, and we were so excited to have you here also. Thanks for answering all. I, can you please uh, stop your screen share so that you can... Yeah, yeah. I'll stop the screen uh, actually, we are having a very excited, I mean, we are excited that SJ Kasi sir has also joined uh, here. Yeah, he and messaged me. I was, yeah. I had performance anxiety when he said, I'll, I'll watch <laughs> you <Yeah>. live. <laughs> so, actually, uh, we'll have, he has one question. So, I think he can ask it live. And we also have former um, director of uh, ICH, ICH, Dr. Ehlers, madam, also joined with us, actually. So, okay, that's nice. Right. Uh, Kasi sir? Yeah, thank, uh, you. thank you, Dr. Anurag. As usual, a very, very comprehensive and lucid discussion. Thank you, sir. And um, uh, very happy that you have emphasized and re emphasized the use of uh, rabies monoclonal antibodies or immunoglobulins in the management of wound uh, management of rabies. Um, can I ask a question now at this stage? Now, I think, Dr. Anurag, I think we had discussed this before. One is, does local infiltration suppress the vaccine response? Uh, sir, uh, we were looking at data, though not statistically significant, but yes, titers are comparatively lower when you give uh, IM, the vaccine, when you give the immunoglobulin IM. No, if you local infiltration, because we are not using IM at all now. Yeah, yeah, local infiltration will suppress the vaccine much less as compared to the IM. Group. Okay. And uh, now, just some queries about the antibody titers that occur over a period of time following vaccination. Suppose you are giving a pre-exposure, you're given mm -hmm. zero, 07, and day 8, mm -hmm. there is a category 3 exposure. How will you manage this situation? Uh, yeah, very tricky. So, if it is before day 14, I would prefer to give immunoglobulin. And if it is after day 14, I will uh, not give immunoglobulin. Now, day 8 is a borderline. So, yes. I think you should give immunoglobulin. Now, will this immunoglobulin affect the vaccine response? Do you then have to restart vaccination or just continue the no, shot? No, no, no. It will, it will not affect the vaccine response. You can continue uh, your, uh, convert the pre-exposure to post-exposure prophylaxis. See, actually, sir, two doses or three doses of vaccine are sufficient to have adequate antibody titers. The remaining two we are giving in excess, if you ask me. So now WHO has already reduced one from uh, five, it has come to four. And in intradermal route, it has come to three. So if you look at it, see, uh, what we are doing is we are giving just two doses of vaccine on day zero and day seven. And we are looking at titers on day 20. This is a thesis I am doing. And at day 20, we are having excellent titers in the patient. So even two doses are sufficient. So uh, we are do overdoing it for the simple reason that because it is a 100% fatal illness. So we are want to give protection uh, to all the patients as much as possible. Otherwise, in pre-exposure prophylaxis, WHO has recommended just two doses now, zero and seven, and they are giving good titles. And one last query from my side: spirit test is for differentiation between category one and two or two and three. Sir, it is uh, see category two is redundant if you ask me. It has no meaning as such. Okay. So either it is category one. That is, you don't need to do anything or you need immunoglobulin and vaccine. But WHO is still persisting with category two that you have some kind of abrasion where there is no burning on spirit test. So you give just the vaccine. It's a half-hearted kind of a treatment. 
So either you have category three where you give immunoglobulin and vaccine. What situation will you have that you have the virus but it will bind after fourteen days? How can you say that? Right. So either the virus is there and will bind or it will not bind. So category two is not a very good category. So uh, it's an academic question as such, but practically speaking. either you are exposed to the virus or not exposed to the virus which is penetrated into your body right so matlab in Thank fact you. i would prefer a category 4 as i said in fact you were also saying last time when we met that right. you have if you have a bite wherein the animal has bitten so deeply that it has directly impinged on the nerve endings yes so therein even if you have taken pre exposure prophylaxis i would prefer to give some immunoglobulin and of course two or three or whatever shots of vaccines you want to give done Thank you, Doctor Anurag. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kasi sir, for this excellent uh, introduction and joining with us. It's giving us a lot of morale for. Another day, there's a lot of question about mucosal. Yes, uh, now, uh, paral. I'm just taking the question one by one. Uh, paralytic form of rabies, how commonly reported? Um, not very common. Actually, problem is that we get hydrophobias and aerophobias, which are reported as rabies, and twenty percent of rabies present as encephalitis, which we miss. For the simple reason that we do not, we only do a clinical diagnosis. We hardly do a, a proper uh, tissue diagnosis or a microbiological confirmation because facilities are not available. So we are missing out on encephalitic form of rabies. We are missing out on paralytic form of rabies. We are only picking up hydrophobias and aerophobias. So, Somebody can I ask? have a comment, Narmada? Yes, sir. Please, yes, sir. Raghurwal, very nicely covered. We have a lot of questions, but fortunately, Anwar, you answered most of all the questions. I mean, I worked in ICU. ICU. We had around four to five children who were a period of ten years presenting with uh, GBS-like picture, paralytic uh, picture, right. with a history mm -hmm. of dog bite. There was a lot of uh, yes, uh, difficulty in making a diagnosis. Anyway, we treated as GBS, intubated, ventilated, and when they died, we took a brain biopsy in few, and we also took corneal impression when they were alive, and mm -hmm. all of them showed negri bodies. So probably so, uh, there is a history of dog bite and GBS, which has to be considered as a possibility. And yeah. anti antimortem, we did the corneal impression because we have a good, uh, for a good uh, veterinary college here. So they were helping us in uh, demonstrating the antigen and negative bodies. So yes, I I agree with you, sir. That's what I'm saying. We are missing out on patients because ultimately across the country, maybe a center like yours was able to do. something for uh, microbiological diagnosis otherwise we rely on clinical diagnosis only and we are missing out on all paralytic rabies we are missing out on encephalitic rabies i had a i have had a lot of patient wherein there is a history of dog bite within last one and a half month and they present to us with encephalitis so uh, actually csf titers of antibodies is not standardized till date we are trying to standardize it so that we send the csf and if the csf anti has antibodies to a particular extent uh, maybe we can say that it is rabies encephalitis in serum if the patient is unimmunized but he shows titers most probably it is rabies but if the patient has taken two or three shots of vaccines then we don't know if it is because of the disease or because of the vaccine and of course post mortem diagnosis you know patients attendants are very um, unhelpful and the resident is all not very interested and then after you take the sample where to send it who will process it lot of issues are there but yes we do need to look at rabies and in fact in our one of our thesis which uh, i am doing this year we are looking at all the causes of acute encephalitic syndromes and rabies virus is one of the causes let us see what data we get out of it so we are planning to do it we'll start off in another month or so the eyelid external ear mucous membrane as well as conjunctiva these are the four places where it is difficult to give the uh, local administration of immunoglobulin how do we give this yes so conjunctiva is the easiest You dilute uh, the immunoglobulin one is to one and give it as eye drops and still as eye drops. Now eyelid, yes, it is a problem. You infiltrate with the twenty six gauge needle. Even a few drops, say two or three drops, are sufficient. See, the concentration of immunoglobulin is very high in these products. Uh, in Twinrab, you have three hundred IU per ml. So if you give even point two ml. Uh, or point one ml that will also be approximately how much thirty you thirty IU. Whereas we are saying that point five IU per ml is protective if you have that much titer in blood. So you do the little bit of infiltration and the remaining amount we do not advocate IM. But if you look at the WHO doc, in fact, one of the 
uh, one of our doctors had asked me what are the situations wherein you will give immunoglobulin im so one of the situation was wherein you there is no possibility of infiltration like eyelid so you give it on the side which is closest so maybe you give it on the shoulder on your on the side where there was uh, the dog bite so left eyelid you give it on left shoulder something like that i know it's very difficult but uh, try to instill one or two drops at the local site that can be done for example glans penis a uh, child coming with a bite on glans penis what do you do then you have a dog situation where a child was bitten inside the lip on the inside part of yeah, the lip mucous membrane, in, mucous membrane yes you can infiltrate there with that insulin needle a small amount you can make the child gargle with the antibody so all these techniques we have used so once you're injected uh, uh, e rig what to do if the same person has got a snake bite in future yeah dr naginder is my friend yeah. he always asks me such questions so it is difficult i agree with that that is the reason i am saying that don't use the equine product because then you should not get in by snakes because snake product the anti body for the snake which is available is also made from horses so there will be a problem there will there can be chances of serum sickness but uh, thankfully serum sickness up, occurs after 10 to 12 days by that time the person will have recovered from the snake bite hopefully and uh, you have no other choice you have to give equine product which is available which is the asv from the horses and uh, wait for serum sickness if it occurs you have to give combiflam and maybe some amount of steroid to manage the serum sickness nothing else right. should monoclonal antibodies also be infiltrated in the wound only yeah yeah the story is same for all anti uh, for all rabies in the blood and what about rodent and cat bites i think are those required for vaccination yeah yeah cat bites yes definitely yes in fact one of the cases where the child developed rabies i presented was bitten by a cat, cat and rodents cat. yes as i said household rats i have not been found to carry the rabies virus so uh, what is the reason somebody was asking me i said i do not know the reason exactly but household rats whenever they have been surveyed dead rats so the way how do we found out find out what the what uh, the veterinarians do is they randomly sample dead rats dead squirrels dead birds dead dogs and look for the virus presence of rabies virus if the virus is present in these animals means that the animal died because of rabies so that is the way they do it so in mice they have not found the virus till date so, uh, the, uh, everything is still dead squirrel squirrel bites also needs rapid vaccination yeah, i am giving it now although literature does not mention it because of the case report from sri lanka wherein dead squirrels had rabies rabies viruses so i have started out but books are not mentioning it till date So does the wound by by size based infiltration formula you've given also is applying for rabies shield? Yeah, yeah, it is the volume infiltrated, not the uh, amount of immunoglobulin in IU. It is the volume. So in a one centimeter wound, how much can you infiltrate? See, uh, in my center, we infiltrate ten to twelve patients daily. So there, in the sister is an expert as compared to a person who infiltrates maybe once in a month. So to give him a rough estimate, we. how much volume he should be able to infiltrate it was for that so it is an ml so whatever product you are using uh, it's all right so if you use uh, twin rab you will be giving much more protein per ml as compared to the other, other products so maybe an advantage of twin rab when to repeat pre exposure prophylaxis uh you don't need to repeat it uh, uh, you repeat it only if you have a bite that is uh, you, uh, zero and three so this is for life again uh, having said that there are two or three categories here also which i have not discussed uh, it is one is the low risk category which are people like us second is medium risk the ones who work in um, situations where uh, like veterinarians who can be exposed to bites like uh, uh, veterinarians and third category is are uh, those handling live viruses in labs like those working in uh, vaccine manufacturing facilities so though people who work in vaccine manufacturing facilities get their antibody titers done every 6 monthly and if the titer goes below 0.5 iu they take one booster whereas those like veterinarians can do it every yearly or two yearly and again same story titer below 0.5 you take a booster and for people like us we don't recommend this in the same note the have... child with a household pet who is fully immunized does he need pre exposure prophylaxis uh yes that's what i said uh yes, whenever you bring the bring a dog uh, in your house please take pre exposure otherwise you will have this problem of scratches and bites and then you'll go to a pediatrician even say that guideline says this 
and then you feel ki doctor is uh, unnecessarily asking for a vaccine immunoglobulin best is take uh, pre exposure prophylaxis so it is asked like if the dog is alive and healthy 10 days after the bite is the, is it that the patient is less likely to have the infection yeah yeah see uh, again although there is a creeping theory that dogs may act as carriers it is not proven still so i am not uh, committing to it i have a feeling that dogs are acting as carriers because some dogs which were not vaccinated were found to have uh, anti rabies antibodies nobody is been able to explain it why but a uh, majority of dogs die within 10 days so if the dog is alive and healthy after 10 days uh, you are you are deemed to be bitten by a dog who is not rabid so you can take your day 28 dose you may omit the day 14 dose to convert your post exposure to pre exposure to yeah and if those children had received only 0 3 and 7 doses and 28 days dose was not given on re exposure should be should they give the whole dosage um again uh, see uh, if you look at the guidelines which are being followed in india from ncdc the answer is yes take a complete post exposure prophylaxis but if you follow the who guideline which says just two doses are required 0 and 7 then you do not need to take rabies immunoglobulin or the vaccine so these are two different guideline i will go with the who one personally at my level but for uh, practice level level when you have a patient you go with the ncdc guide okay somebody has asked for uh, even for small open wound the entire dose of immunoglobulin should be given intravenous i think it is intramus around the wound no no uh, that's what uh, uh, i said again and again in my presentation that 40 iu per kg so 40 into body weight will give you the maximum dose for that patient you give uh, you do not exceed the maximum dose you give the dose as per the wound size the remaining amount use it for the next patient like for us we have 10 to 12 patients daily so you can use the remaining immunoglobulin in the next patient so you are saving cost uh, to the government as such because the average requirement is not more than 1 ml per patient so the rabies encephalitis like is there any specific management uh, uh no not now at present there was a milwaukee protocol and in which it is said that deep uh, sedation and ventilation and then the patient may recover after a month or so with some amount of with a lot of neurological sequelae in fact in our uh, ncdc meeting we were discussing this we need centers wherein uh, doctors will uh, should ventilate these patients and see the outcome because what is happening is whenever we have a rabies patient we tell him go go nothing can be done he goes home and dies or he goes to a infectious disease hospital from there he is chased off to his home and he dies nobody is ventilating these patients so we start ventilating these patients we maybe we will be able to see some amount of uh, survival in these patients nobody is doing it and we uh, we have requested the ncdc to send out a, an, a circular to all the tertiary hospitals to try and ventilate these patients because see uh, no case of human transmission is reported that is this doctor or nurse getting infected from a rabid patient number one and we have all done residency we have all intubated n number of encephalitis patients and some of them were rabies patients and no we have never heard of a resident developing rabies suddenly and dying because of exposure to some patient so there is no human transmission known again uh, if you are keeping a patient in the icu you can always take pre exposure prophylaxis and uh, maybe check the antibody titers of the staff every 6 monthly or yearly so that they are doubly sure that they will not develop rabies but yes we need to ventilate these patients and see the outcome there is a uh, there is a proposal going on and i also was a part of i am also a part of that team we had a whole team visiting from us and uh, there was a person from uk and another person from france they have developed a monoclonal antibody which they have not given a name they have just given a number uh, names are naming is done when the product is to be launched in the market they have given a number and they have tried it in animal models they have injected it intrathecally and intravenously in mice models and they have found that if these products are given early the survival is very high and if they are given at just the onset of symptoms the survival is up to the tune of 30 to 40% so uh, this product needs to be tried in humans but they are not available in the market as such so they'll be in only in research mode and let us see when this comes up so presently there is no treatment yes we should try and ventilate these patients and 
see if we are able to save them. So can we use the same needle? Although you have said that, don't give it reminding IM. Someone has asked if can we use the same needle for both uh, at the site of the wound and for immunoglobulin and for intramuscular injections for the immunoglobulin which we are using. Uh, ideally, you should change the needle. Don't give it IM. Change the needle. Um, but of course, you should not use it in the next patient for same needle. Yes. Sir, uh, and if you're giving uh, the immunoglobulin, are it be piercing the nerves? Isn't it similar to suturing? Um, I didn't get the question. No, no. We are. Uh, you said no to sutures because we are uh, innervating the nerves, right? So, but when we're giving the needles injections, also, are we not innervating the nerves? Yeah. See, uh, you have to look at the lesser evil, na? So, when you are giving the immunoglobulin through the needle, you are covering that track with the immunoglobulin. So, if the virus is there, it will be bound by the immunoglobulin and the virus shall be destroyed. So, and of course, other than that, what option is there? So, you have to give it by some route. So, suturing, yes, unnecessarily increasing the penetration of the virus, not needed. Whereas, immunoglobulin, you need to develop it by some route. If you have some other better route in mind, let us know. We will give it a try. Two doses of zero and three after post-exposure prophylaxis, does it hold good for rest of the life? Yeah, yeah, less, rest of the life. Definitely, yes. After so, there are studies with uh, 25 years of uh, post, -ex post uh, getting a pre-exposure prophylaxis and the uh, patients showed a very good response. So, it holds for life now at present. After pre-exposure prophylaxis, does any booster need it, sir? No, no, not needed. Again, as I said, and people like us, we are low risk, not needed. Veterinarians, titers every yearly or two yearly so and lab workers every six months. So yeah, the three children levels. Are, children are now coming with 65 kg at 15 years. So how to use the upper limit? That also you have So uh, as I said, there is no upper limit. Upper WHO limit. had upper limits. Uh, in they, It removed upper limits in 2014. So you multiply 40 IU into body weights straight. Actually, Satish Kumar sir from CMC had joined, but he's in the, not in the panel link. And he's asked, is there a risk of human to human transmission and rabies? Is another uh, sir, th theoretically, yes. Practically, nobody has seen a case. There has been no case reported till date. Yeah, Dr. Kandamaran has asked. Narmada, Dr. Narmada, do you remember one of your classmates was bitten by a rabid yeah. patient? I don't tell the name. And same, he was bitten by a patient admitted in ICU with rabies. Bitten. And then, fortunately, we gave, uh, at the time, immunoglobulin was available. Immunoglobulin we gave. And rabies vaccine, uh, fortunately, escaped. Uh, yes, sir. If you if the rabbit patient bites you, then there is a possibility. But aerosolized transmission is not, well, through the air, it is not uh, known as such, not been reported. And that bite also, yes, you can have through bites. But rabies patients are not usually biting. They are not able to swallow. They are not able to... The, actually, uh, this child yeah, came yeah. as an asthma, acute severe asthma, sir. When they were okay. doing suctioning, mm -hmm. uh, so even when we are doing suctioning, the uh, child uh, bitten him. Mm -hmm. At that time, we didn't think about the rabies later, only rabies diagnosis, postulated. Okay. The child, child must have closed the mouth suddenly. Fortunately, with uh, immunoglobulin infiltrated around the wound, uh, mm -hmm. no problem for him. Well, the it... child must have closed, closed the mouth suddenly. Na? Well, he, the child is not actively biting. You put your finger in his mouth and he closes the mouth. Maybe that must have occurred. Dr. Kandamaran has asked if the patient is a dog bite and on the vaccination schedule, if he has an appendicitis, does it change the route of management? Uh, patient has a dog bite and? He's on the exposure prophylaxis also. At that time, he has appendicitis. What a question. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, <laughs> Vaccination should be appendicitis. Cut, 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 cut. Uh, well, vaccine. See, uh, more relevant is that a patient gets a dog bite and he has just received another vaccine, a live vaccine or a killed vaccine, what to do. So that is more relevant. Uh, like a child who just received DPT some time ago or is due for DPT. So uh, you can mix and match with any vaccine you want to. Rabies vaccine will not cause a problem. In fact, a better question would have been that uh, after giving uh, HRIG, uh, should we give vaccination for next three months? Because if you look at the uh, immunization guidelines, uh, after giving IVIG, uh, you should not give uh, live vaccines for up to six months or something, if I remember correctly. Yeah, six months, months or nine months. Uh, First some of all, says, by IM and the second by ID, is it possible, sir? Can we mix IM uh, and ID route? Yeah, you can uh. mix the IM and ID routes. It <laughs> is not a problem. Whatever route you are using, continue with that schedule. 
does a human bite require vaccination with anti rabies no uh human bite if the human is rabid you should go for an immunoglobulin and vaccine otherwise no humans keep biting each other day in and day out and that uh, i think dog bite 3 years after uh, one one year after similar bite how many doses 03 03 any time can yeah after 90 days is 03 for life can rabies virus survive in blood products like ffp uh rabies virus surviving in blood products uh i don't think we have never heard of rabies developing after uh, giving any blood product as such because uh, these products are maybe ma- manufactured in such a way that our viruses are killed irradiation and all those processes are followed so that is a not a possibility and uh, the what about immunosuppressive patients sir i will take the question because it's from your friend acha <laughs> uh, see uh, uh, i am going to ask question ma'am yes ma'am only my, ask you see sir has given one question ma'am that's all with that we are winding uh, up no more question no more question uh, in my thesis what we are doing is we are doing pre exposure prophylaxis in ch- children with uh, nephrotic syndromes and uh, those on methotrexate because, because of jia i have the series of around 20 patients with me who followed with me for jia so in those also i am giving uh, rabies uh, vaccine and seeing their titers on after day 07 they are showing a good response on day 28 slightly lesser than the non immunocompromised ones and then let us see what titers they have at uh, one year but again having said that if you are immunocompromised you should take the vaccine and immunoglobulin in case of exposure even though you have taken a pre exposure prophylaxis or a post exposure prophylaxis earlier right so immunocompromised patient both immunoglobulin and vaccine at every exposure they have to take sir kasi sir has noted that there is no after rabies immunoglobulin no live vaccine for 5 months and uh, rabies virus is a very labile virus do you want to add on anything sir with that we we'll close no no sir is sir is right because after hra uh, you should not take uh, vaccines for 5 uh, to 6 months other vaccines live vaccines but after monoclonal antibodies because they are single antibodies monoclonal you can take any vaccine you want to thank you so much dr anurag sir for answering all our questions so you know very patient way uh, if dakshayan is there i recommend uh, dani ma'am do you want in, to add any words and dr balshankar sir i think it was a wonderful session thanks dr anurag sir yeah there are two three more questions uh, in pregnancy there is no change in schedule can rabies virus survive in soil and sunlight no it cannot survive drying kills the virus heating over 50 degrees centigrade kills the virus so it does not survive very labile virus So any more questions? Role of antibiotic. Can I or uh, mail ID? They can yeah. ask you directly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ma'am. Role of antibiotic very important. Uh, I didn't talk about it. Pasteurella multocida is transmitted through the saliva of dogs. So amoxicillin should be given in uh, uh, dog bites. Uh, ideally, amoxicillin should be given because it kills the Pasteurella multocida. And uh, I think uh, more questions you can send us on email. Consortium against rabies at gmail dot com. Very simple to remember. Because they will have and questions. We will answer them. There will be a lot of questions. That's why we <laughs> and Dr. Thirumurugan decided. So, Dr. Balashankar sir and Dr. Thirumurugan sir for final words, and we'll close. Thank you. This is a very wonderful lecture with uh, so much of uh, practical uh, aspects we have dealt with. We are really um, uh, uh, enlightened by your uh, lucid lecture, sir. It's a very practically useful lecture uh, in the recent times I have ever heard. Thank you so much, sir. So only one thing: after infiltration, can we put on some one or two drops of the uh, immune globulin over the wound? Will it help? Because there is no harm, sir. There is no harm. Can uh, be more, and uh, after injecting, we may have something, and we can can we drop or put a drop or two over that wound itself? Sir, uh, when you infiltrate, the guideline is that infiltrate till immune globulin oozes out of the wound. So when it oozes out of the wound, it will cover the surface of the wound as such. Yes, you understand. So there is no need to put on a few drops there and there because it will already ooze and cover the wound. So that is the aim of oozing out of the wound. Sir, when we went to a midterm CME in Kolkata, when sir gave the lecture, five hundred participants were spellbound for forty-five minutes. That's the time Jeremy Madam said Tamil Nadu people have to be benefited, and then we'll have it as the next lecture. We got it. That's why, sir. Doctor Thirumurugan, okay. final words. <clears throat> Thank you very much, sir. um the fact that we have had uh, another blockbuster attendance uh, uh, itself says the quality of your uh, session and i just wish that uh, all the points which uh, 
the i mean you told uh, gets across to people what we will try to do is to make uh, get points out of your session and put it in our e bus folder and use e that is something to make sure that it reaches all our people it's our bi monthly newsletter which comes out from iab tamil nadu I'm sure Dr. Ananda will try to do the same. Yeah, thing. yeah, the same for micro service. I, I know. Let's see who gets it first. So, thank you very much, sir. And you know, both of us, we, we, we can have a pointers in the e-pub, sir, and full article. Always to have you here with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Dakshayani. Can we give her the vote of thanks? Yeah, ma'am. Um, <laughs> so, on behalf of the IIT chapter of IIP Tamil Nadu and the IIP Tamil Nadu State Chapter, I thank Dr. Anurag Agrawal. professor of pediatrics uh, ma'am c for his excellent and extensive presentation on rabies that was phenomenal sir and um, so much of information on this topic was really interesting and enlightening mm -hmm. uh, the ever changing guidelines on this topic of rabies uh, they convey to us that uh, it is always evolving and uh, the understanding of the disease uh, is uh, happening every day in and out you brought out the answers to the queries very well sir and i thank the vibrant team of iap id chapter uh, tamil nadu dr janani madam dr narmada and dr rajkumar for having arranged this topic you made the audience stay glued to the screen until last thank you so much sir you are also part of the team daksh you are able to work only with <laughs> no ma'am so support from you and dr thirumurgan and so she she's always there for all the programs thank you so much thanks for thank all thank you ma'am sweet of you thank you so <laughs> thank you sir, sir good night tagavel sir for being with us it's been it's a real morale booster that you have joined with us for the whole program sir thank you thank you thank you thank you anurag sir thank you so much thank you ma'am thank, thank, thank you for having me thank you, thank you kashi sir for your Thank you.